At a meeting of the Manchester Philosophical Society in 1911, when the great Dalton was the chairman, Rutherford first said that, in his opinion, it was rather difficult to come up with the structure of the atom, and the atom, which contains both positive and negative charges, looks as though it has a very small dense formation in its center, which he called the core. And the electrons, which by that time were known, revolve around it at a considerable distance. In fact, at a very great distance. The distance exceeds the size of the nucleus by five orders of magnitude. If we have a ping-pong ball here in the audience, then the electrons are spinning somewhere near the train station, the furthest station of Dubna. This assumption, as always in the scientific community, was met with skepticism. Rutherford was not really believed, despite the fact that he suggested it was very similar to how the planets revolve around the Sun. The nucleus mass is 99.98% of the atom and contains 100% positive charge. Nevertheless, the image that Rutherford described was called the planetary model of the atom. And there was only one concern. When an electron revolves around a positive charge, motion in a circle is motion with acceleration. And according to Maxwell's equation, it will radiate in a spiral while losing energy and thus will very quickly fall on the nucleus in about 10 to minus 8 seconds. His teacher, J.J. Thompson, said, 10 to minus 11 seconds will not pass before this electron will fall on the nucleus. That was in the month of March. When the Solvay Congress took place in the summer of that same year, 1911, Rutherford was there too, and no one even remembered his model. The scientific community only really started talking about it two years later, when Niels Bohr, Rutherford's employee and theorist, decided to try to explain the model. He suggested that it is probably correct that the electron radiates, but that they, Bohr and Rutherford, assume that it does not. This was a slightly strange assumption. Rutherford and Bohr made the assumption and hypothesized that the electrons move in a circular orbit around the charge center and do not radiate. Therefore, the electron can radiate only when it jumps from one orbit to another, where it will radiate, and only then can the electron either gain or lose energy. This can be likened to a car, and in order for it to move from point A to point B, it loses petrol or fuel, but only when it moves from the garage to another destination. With these assumptions in mind, Bohr calculated what the orbits would be, and that these orbits, therefore, will take some integer value, and that each orbit can be described by quantum numbers, the number of the orbit. And you can show the smallest orbit, the orbit of hydrogen, where z is equal to 1. And for this orbit, you can calculate the radius of this movement, which turned out to be 0.5 times 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters, which is really five orders of magnitude more than one femtometer. You can also calculate the speed, the speed of the electron, which moves around the hydrogen atom, was 2.2 times 10 to the power of 8 centimeters per second, which is now called Bohr's speed, as well as the bond energy of this electron with the nucleus in this equilibrium orbit, which is 13.6 electron volt. Generally speaking, this was a little strange, because, in fact, what did Bohr actually do? Bohr took and began to quantize the orbits. He began to quantize the distances along which electrons move. By this time, energy quanta was already known. But here, 
the same approach was now being applied to distance. Einstein said this is a great discovery, that this is quantum mechanics, a new form of mechanics after Newtonian mechanics, which is now referred to as the old quantum mechanics. Bohr also explained all the transitions that can be observed in the hydrogen atom. These are the long series of atomic excitation which were observed in the spectrometer. First the Limanov series, then the Balmer series, then the Patient series. n equals 1, equals 2, equals 3, and this is what we see as they fall. This is the basic state, the orbit is minus 13.6 electron volts. This is the first excited level, second, third, fourth and fifth level, and so on. And all these transitions that we see are nothing more than a transition from here to here, from here to there, from here to here, and so on, and all the lines are here. He described all the lines and even predicted what the other lines might be. In fact, such a law was discovered by Rydberg himself. But Rydberg suggested that there must be some constant in front of these quantum numbers. And Bohr calculated this constant with high accuracy. That is, he calculated all these lines with such high accuracy that his results were similar to the measurements later taken with a very precise spectrograph. In 1919, seven years later, while irradiating nitrogen with alpha particles, he discovered the emission of a proton from a hydrogen nucleus. And this, in fact, was the very first ever nuclear reaction. When helium fell on nitrogen, a proton was formed, creating oxygen instead of nitrogen. Now we write this reaction like this. Nitrogen 14, this is alpha, P is removed, and oxygen 17. This was the first demonstration where if we want to change one element to another, we need to change its nucleus. And thus, for the first time, he upstaged all the alchemists' failed attempts who tried to use heat, who tried to poison with chemicals, who tried to use pressure by means of hard impact in order to make, for example, gold from lead. In fact, all they needed to do was to change the nucleus. Only then could it happen.